everyone, and welcome to our third Thursday lecture and 2022 Arboretum virtual event. Tredifferin Public Library and Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens are thrilled to welcome Kyle Imhoff for tonight's presentation, Pennsylvania's Changing Climate. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Amy Mobby, Education Manager at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. Thank you to all of our members joining us tonight for your continued support and a big welcome to all of our non-members out there. And with all of you in mind, let me take a minute to share a little bit about our garden. Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens is a 48 acre botanical garden located in the Philadelphia suburbs. We specialize in plants native to the region and are also home to a world-class collection of rhododendrons and azaleas. Jenkins is open to visitors every day of the year and is always free of an admission fee, thanks to community and donor support. So now I'm gonna let my co-host introduce herself. Zoe. Hi everyone, my name is Zoe Mills and I am the Adult Programming and Community Outreach Librarian at Tradefrom Public Library. Tradefrom Public Library is excited and proud to continue the partnership between the library and Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. This collaborative partnership allows the library to reach its mission of leading and strengthening a community of lifetime learners engaged in discovery, creation, entertainment, and enrichment. The Arboretum event is a program series born from a collaboration between the library and Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. During the program, the library and the Arboretum work together to provide opportunities to promote literacy, library and arboretum usage and community conversations by encouraging Tredifferin Township to come together by reading and discussing a single book. For 2022, we are reading and discussing Dr. Kimberly, Kimberly Nicholas's book, Under the Sky We Make, How to Be Human in a Warming World. A fun bonus for tonight's attendees, we have a few extra copies of Under the Sky We Make and we want to get them in your hands. We will, be, we will be doing a free book giveaway from the registration list and we'll contact you via email if you are a winner. Keep an eye out. You do need to be local to win as you will need to pick up the books at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens in Devon. Great. So now for a few housekeeping items. We are using Zoom webinar format so we can't see or hear you at home. Feel free to eat your snacks and let your dogs bark. We will not know. We are recording tonight's presentation and we'll be able to share that with anyone who registered. It'll just take a few days to process and we'll have that ready and send that out via Eventbrite. We would like to ask that everyone uses the Q&A for speaker questions that we will ask at the end of the presentation. You can use chat for general comments or tech issues that will come to myself and to Zoe. So on to the main event. We are so excited to have Kyle with us tonight. Kyle Imhoff joined the Pennsylvania State Climate Office in August 2011 and became Pennsylvania State Climatologist in July 2016. In addition to serving as Pennsylvania State Climatologist, Kyle is also an assistant research professor at Penn State University. He teaches courses in weather forecasting, applied climatology, and introductory meteorology for turf grass applications. His research interests include applied climatology, synoptic meteorology, numerical weather prediction, and weather risk. So at this point, I will turn things over to Kyle to get us started. Okay, well, thank you, Amy, for the introduction and, and thank you for having me here this evening and, and thank you all at home for, for joining the talk tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, Amy teed it up pretty well here. So we're, we're going to be talking about uh, changes in climate, and we're going to focus on, on the state of Pennsylvania here tonight. And uh, we'll, we'll start off before we get into talk of climate change and, and the science behind it and the communication and, and those aspects um, toward the latter half of this talk. I want to spend some time first talking about the climate data that we use on a regular basis, where we're able to calculate those trends historically, and then try to attempt to make model predictions and make model forecasts going years, decades, or centuries into the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that here at the beginning, and then we'll talk about some trends in climate data across the state of Pennsylvania, 
talk about extreme weather events we've observed over the past several decades. And then again, we'll, we'll transition to talking about climate change. We'll have a broader discussion. So we'll, we'll, we'll move out of Pennsylvania for a little bit and look globally at the science behind climate change. And then I'll bring it back down to a regional and, and state scale and talk about how things are gonna impact the Northeast and Pennsylvania from a climate perspective. And then I'll talk a little bit about challenges with scientific communication and where um, scientists can do maybe a better job in certain aspects and the general public um, can, can be able to discern this information or, or, or get this information in a more useful manner. So I'll talk about that towards, uh, towards the end today. So just, just briefly to, to start off talking about state climatology and state climate offices, there is a professional organization, the American Association of State Climatologists, that recognize state climate offices across the country. You'll see on the map here that all states across the country have a state climate office except the one, Massachusetts, who we're working on right now as an organization to get them a state climatologist, hopefully within the next couple of years. So most states have one, um, and actually, so this, this has actually changed. It's now 49 out of 50 states. So uh, we went up one this year, actually. So that, uh, that, that's an update from, from when I last updated this. So some are housed within state government agencies. So a lot of state climatologists work for the state government. Here in Pennsylvania, we're, we're different. We're actually housed within uh, a university setting at Penn State. And that's fairly common across the country. Most climate offices are within university settings. So our primary focus is research, but then we also have outreach uh, components and uh, service to the general public at whatever state we serve. Uh, most of us are geographers, geoscientists, me, I'm an atmospheric scientist, I'm a meteorologist by trade, so there's also diversity in state climatologists across the country. And there are additional climate service organizations across the country, um, regional climate centers, regional climate hubs that also help us out at the state level with climate services. So this is just a map to illustrate to you all of the, this will tee up some of the discussion about the climate data that we have across the state of Pennsylvania. So all those little pins you see, it's not necessarily important what network they're part of there, but that's just indicating different weather networks across the, the state of Pennsylvania. So you can see we have fairly good coverage for, for much of the state, particularly you'll notice the, the fairly high densities in southeastern and southwestern Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. So very good coverage for, for weather data across the state of Pennsylvania. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about climate data sets and, and how they work. So the FAA and the National Weather Service manage uh, what we refer to as ASOS systems, and you're looking at a picture of that right here. And they're, uh, ASOS stands for Automated Surface Observing System, and these are automated weather reports that come out hourly or even sub-hourly um, that report all sorts of important meteorological information, things like the, the stuff you would expect, temperatures, dew points, wind speed, direction, cloud status, present weather, obstructions to visibility. Those are the types of things that, that these uh, automated weather stations will report on a regular basis. So you don't need outside of maintenance and making sure everything is calibrated properly. This has no human intervention in terms of the actual reporting system itself. It's all automated. It's just sending out signals every, uh, every 30 or 60 minutes. And there's about, a little less than 1,000, 900 to 950 sites across the country that have these ASOS units that you're looking at there. We consider these the primary source for high quality weather data across the country. And again, they're, they're mostly focused at, at large airport sites. And you can, you can figure out the reason why you would want to have high quality weather data at an airport. Uh, weather will have a significant impact on airport operations, particularly when you have disruptive weather. So that was why these stations were installed at airport locations. And most of these sites were, were implemented post-World War II when a lot of airports were built and we started to be, be able to have the capabilities to, to communicate enough to where you could report this in, on a semi-regular basis from these sites. There's lots of other real-time weather networks across, across the state of Pennsylvania and across the country. So there are RWIS systems, there are roadway weather information systems, and these are managed within the state of Pennsylvania by PennDOT and the Turnpike Commission. They have their own network as well. They're also focused in addition to meteorological data. They measure things like roadway temperature, ice thickness on the road, things that would be important to transportation. There's also the COPAMS network here in the state, and that stands for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Air Monitoring System. That's managed by our Department of environmental protection. And they're focused on other things. Again, in addition to weather data, they're looking at air pollutant concentrations and, and other things that uh, deal with air quality across the state. And then you have the ROS network, which is Remote Automated Weather Station Network. And that's 
Um, that network was designed primarily for fire weather management. So they measure things like fuel moisture and temperature across the state of Pennsylvania. Now, I want to talk a little bit, so I'm going to show some, some graphs and, and charts in, in a few minutes here, and, and a lot of the, the data that goes behind those, those charts and graphs are from this network here that I'm talking about right now. It's the, the National Weather Service Cooperative Observer Network, and I consider this the backbone of surface-based U.S. climate data sets. It's the, now, this is a... a uh, no, nothing automated about this. These are all volunteer humans out there um, actually going out and measuring things in their in their backyards or wherever these, these stations are located. And they're measuring daily variables, max and min temperature. So what was the highest and lowest temperature of the past 24 hours? How much rain has fallen, and then a lot of a lot of sites will report how much snow has fallen too over the last uh, the last 24 hours. Most observers will report in the morning, so first thing in the morning or or just after they wake up, seven eight o'clock in the morning Eastern time, um, those reports will come in, and much of that data that, uh, like I said before, much of the data presented in this talk will be based off of that that co-op data. There's also the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. So we call this COCORAWS for short. Now, in addition to being Pennsylvania State Climatologist, I'm also a state coordinator for COCORAWS. If there's any weather enthusiasts in the crowd tonight, some of you may have heard of this network or may even be a volunteer for this network. Um, anybody can do this with the rain gauge. So you'll see there at the bottom, if anyone is interested, feel free to contact me. That's my, my email address. Um, and I would be happy to, to get you signed up and, and have an additional observer for the network. So this again is reported daily. So it's a 24 hour, this is just focused on precipitation. We, we do not do temperatures for this network. So we're just looking at how much rain or snow has primarily fallen over the past 24 hours. It's a very high quality network of precipitation information. And this again is high quality weather data that we use not only for looking at historical trends and information, but also uh, data input that goes into modeling and future projections of weather and climate. Now this is a data display. So we developed this, this uh, website. Uh, the Climate Office has sponsored this website uh, within the past couple of years. Um, it's now at a place where, where I, can, I can start to present this at, at talks. It's, it's called the Keystone Mesonet. And what we've done is we've aggregated a lot of uh, weather networks across the state. So all, all the things I just talked about, plus some other networks that I didn't cover. Um, and you can see here, I just grabbed this screenshot earlier this afternoon, um, showing temperatures across the state. So it might be a little hard to read depending on the size of your screen. But these little bubbles here are telling you what the temperature is. These little barbs uh, that, that are connected to the bubbles are showing you wind direction um, and wind speed. So where, where the wind is blowing from and at what speed. And then I also have radar and, uh, and a gridded temperature data set underneath that. So this is a really nice website. I'd encourage you to, to take a look at it if you have a chance and, and play around with it and, and see what kind of data is displayed there. But this is a really good source for, for real-time weather information. And, and a lot of the climate data I just spoke about is also displayed on this, uh, on this page. Now, there are some caveats, so I, I like to spend some time talking about this because I found that, that there's a lot of confusion amongst not only those in the general public, but even uh, in the scientific community and the technical crowd, that there is some, some serious confusion about what uh, weather data is um, displayed on certain maps, and then also what um, dates mean and what times mean when it comes to observational data. So there's a couple um, quirky things about weather data that I wanted to go over here in case you ever come across this or if you're if you happen to be digging into climate data yourself. The airport locations that I mentioned earlier, those are those automated weather stations that report hourly or sub hourly. When you see daily reports from those sites, it's usually summed up from a midnight to midnight period, what you would typically expect, a calendar day summary of what happened at that specific location. Now, I mentioned that the, the co-op sites are the human observers that are measuring things in their backyard or, or near their home, that are reporting 24-hour summaries of, of whatever weather occurred over the past 24 hours, that's taken in the morning. So if you think about it, if, if you go out in the morning, let's say I have an example here of uh, December 22nd, the morning of December 22nd, you go out and check your rain gauge to see how much rain has fallen. In reality, most of that rain has likely occurred the prior day because it's 24 hours from the time you measure back to when you measured previously, which would have been yesterday morning. So oftentimes when you see co-op uh, co network data that's displayed on a map or if it's summarized somewhere in a report, 
you'll see the date as December 22nd. Well, oftentimes people will interpret that as, okay, that's how much precipitation fell on December 22nd, right? It's a, it's a calendar day. That's how much rain fell that day. But actually, you almost have to subtract the day from it because a lot of that precipitation would have fallen the previous day. So this is this is a serious confusion, and I get a lot of questions about this. So I I just like to cover this. Like I said, if you ever stumble across some of this the, these issues, or if you're comparing data sets where you're looking at um, ASOS data or airport data, and you're comparing to a volunteer observer report, um, there are differences in how these things are reported. Of course, if you ever have any questions or or you do have confusion about this at any point, um, you can you can talk to me or anybody that's um, that that works with climate data on a regular basis. But that that always leads to confusion. Now, talking about the climate of Pennsylvania here for a minute, what are the main, the main things that impact our long-term weather patterns, which we, which we call climate? So obviously, close, uh, our, our close proximity to bodies of water, the Atlantic Ocean to our east, the Great Lakes off to our north and west, uh, frequent moisture transport from the Gulf of Mexico leads to our state being a persistently wet region. So we don't tend to get extended periods of drought. Um, they can be highly disruptive when they do occur, but they're relatively rare. And uh, across the entire calendar year, we generally average between three and four inches of rainfall each, each individual month. We don't really have a wet and a dry season like you would see out in the Southwest um, or monsoon seasons or anything like that. We're fairly consistently wet here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, you, you probably know this already, but our winds are generally from the west, so a lot of our weather um, that we experience here in the state comes from the Midwest or, or southwest of the state of Pennsylvania, and those, those winds from the west tend to bring relatively frequent storm systems and disturbances in the atmospheric flow. Northwest winds in the wintertime, again, some of you are probably familiar with this, they bring relatively cold weather and uh, southerly flow in the summer provides hot and humid weather. And of course, northwest flow also in the wintertime brings lake effect snow um, for those in the higher elevations of northern and western Pennsylvania. And we're a unique state in that many extreme weather events can occur. So we can get anything from the remnants of tropical cyclones to severe winter storms, to severe thunderstorm activity, tornadic activity. So we, we really span the, the, the wide diverse um, uh, patterns or weather patterns that we can experience and, and some of those extreme weather events that, that can pop up from time to time. We're, we're about as susceptible as, as any state in the country to, to all of those disruptive weather patterns. Okay, so now we're gonna look at historical weather data here for the next uh, several slides. So we're gonna talk about trends in climate data. So we're gonna look back through the last 7,500, 125 years, um, depending on the periods of record of some of these climate data sets. And we're gonna look at what has happened already? What have we observed just from, from the several decades that we've had high quality weather observational data? And then once we get later into this talk, I'll talk about some of those, those model projections. What does the future bring? Um, and we'll, we'll get into some of those things a little bit later on here. So before we get into the trend analysis, I just want to take one step back to talk about the data for a second. In addition to having those individual weather stations and weather observers at different cities and, and, and uh, towns across the state of Pennsylvania, we also split up the state in the climate divisions. The idea behind this is each individual division that you see on this map here, we try to lump uh, counties together that have relatively similar climates. Now, this was done back in the I think it was done probably in the early 50s. Um, so I would probably um, uh, argue with, with some of these divisions that, that the climate is not necessarily similar across some of these counties, but um, this was how the state was split up at the time. And these climate divisions have stayed the same ever since. Um, so this is the, um, the division numbers that are assigned when you look at climate data and you're looking at divisional data. Um, this is where they correspond to geographically on a map. So a lot of the trend analysis that we do will typically be based on climate divisional data if you wanna look at different regions of the state, but I'll also show some statewide statistics as well as we uh, go through these next few slides. And uh, the last thing I'll talk about here from a climate data perspective before we get into the trends, um, in the state of Pennsylvania, we have what are uh, called 24 HCN sites. And that's the historical climate network. So what these are are the cream of the crop uh, weather observers, so the, those co-op observers that I mentioned earlier that are funded by the National Weather Service, what these sites are, are locations that have been around for a long period of time. So for instance, we have some observers in the state um, that are part of this network actually that have been observing 
consistent daily weather conditions at that location for 75 or 100 years. And you think, well, how, how's that even possible? You know, people are going to move or um, some, somebody uh, passes away and, and nobody takes over. So this becomes a generational thing where somebody will, will take over land from, uh, from their parents or their grandparents, and they'll just continue weather observations. So we're very lucky that we have some, um, some really uh, really enthusiastic weather observers across the state that that have really good quality weather data, where we can really uh, have high confidence that 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 information, that trend analysis that we make at that location is actually valid. That that's been there for a long period of time, done the same way at the same location. Not a lot of changes to the site, those sort of things. That's what we consider the best of the best for um, for this historical climate network. And you'll see a lot of that work, uh, a lot of this data is used for the work that's done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC, which I'm sure you've heard before, um, that make the reports at a global scale um, by the United Nations. So you'll see a lot of this data is used for a lot of that work. Okay, so looking at trends here for, uh, for a few minutes here, this is looking at statewide winter temperatures. So I'm going to do meteorological seasons here. So this is December 1st through the end of February, so February 28th or 29th. So looking at that three-month period for meteorological winter, here is the trend you see across the state of Pennsylvania. So you'll notice there at the bottom I have the trend two tenths of a degree Fahrenheit per, tech, per decade. Um, another way to think of that is a, a two degree Fahrenheit increase in temperatures during the winter season per century. So over the past 100 years or so, our wintertime temperatures on average have gone up by about two degrees. Now, if you look at that, and, and we'll do some other trends, we'll, we'll not just average temperatures, I'll look at high and low temperatures, we'll do, we'll do some other analysis here in a minute, but this is just looking at on average, averaged across the state of Pennsylvania, what are the trends looking like? Now, when we, we, we move into meteorological spring here, March through May, you'll notice that the trend is about a 10th of a degree Fahrenheit per decade, or again, one degree Fahrenheit per, per century. So um, not quite as strong of a signal there uh, during the springtime months. Looking at meteorological summer, this is June through August, you'll see the same, same trend as you saw in the spring, about a degree Fahrenheit per century here. And finally, looking at uh, autumn temperatures here, September through, um, this should be September through November, sorry about that. Um, it's about a degree Fahrenheit per century there as well. So going back through here, just, just rewinding back to the winter is where we're actually seeing the largest increase in temperatures. Looking back several decades or over a century in this case, that is our, our strongest signal in terms of increasing temperatures statewide on average for that three month period. Now let's look at precipitation here for a minute. Um, again, we'll focus on this at a seasonal level. So we'll start off with uh, wintertime precipitation. Um, this is quite interesting. It, it's, it's very rare when you look at climate data that you actually get exactly no trend. <laughs> and you'll see here through the end of the last, uh, the, the most recent decade here at the end of, tw at a tw end of 2019, so um, stopping at the end of the decade there, there is not a trend in wintertime precipitation across the state of Pennsylvania. So while we do see an increase in temperatures, we're not seeing an increase in precipitation during meteorological winter. If we look at the springtime months, so March through May, you'll see about uh, seven hundredths of an inch of precipitation increase per decade, or about seven tenths of an inch of precipitation per century. So not a strong trend, but certainly in the wetter direction during the spring months. When we look at summer, it's, it's a little bit weaker of a trend than what you saw in the spring. So only about five hundredths of an inch per decade. So again, about a half inch of rainfall increase over the past 100 years or so. Now here is where we see the strongest signal. So just like we saw the strongest signal in temperatures was during the winter months, that, that, that increase of a couple of degrees Fahrenheit. Here's where you see the strongest signal in terms of wet weather. Um, we were seeing about a quarter of an inch increase in precipitation per decade. Now that's per decade. So if you think about that, um, expanding now to over 100 years, you're getting two and a half to three inches more rainfall per century. Another way to think about that, I like to, to put it in terms of that's about a month's worth of precipitation for Pennsylvania. So what we're seeing now uh, during the September through November period is about an additional month's worth of precipitation than what we what we saw back in the early 1900s or late 1800s. That's a pretty significant trend when you're getting, you know, four months of rainfall in the same three-month period essentially than what you saw 100 years ago. So that's a pretty significant trend. 
Now I'm, I'm going to zoom in here. So uh, going to division three, which is, which is where um, uh, you guys are, are located, or I'm, I'm guessing most of you probably on this uh, uh, on the zoom session are located in, in um, Southeastern Pennsylvania. This is the trend. And uh, again, looking at, looking at fall months here, September through November, this is an even larger trend in Southeastern Pennsylvania. So uh, it was 0.25 inches per decade across the state on average. It's a little higher than that, all, almost three inches per century um, across the lower Susquehanna. So um, uh, uh, a significant trend in autumn precipitation, a, a, an increase in precipitation during the autumn months. So that, that is an interesting trend for sure. Now we're going to going to take a couple different angles at this. So notice I was looking at statewide um, or climate divisional data, looking at average temperatures and precipitation across three months. Now we're going to look at a couple different variables just to give you some, some different perspectives on how, how this all breaks down when you zoom in on individual towns or locations. So this, this is an, um, uh, a chart here showing um, the lowest minimum temperature, so this is annually, what is the lowest minimum temperature that State College Pennsylvania actually gets to in any individual calendar year? So you'll notice that what, what this is showing you here is that the coldest temperatures you get during the year are about five to eight degrees warmer now than they were over 100 years ago. So five to eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer for your coldest temperatures during the year than what you saw um, over a century ago. That's, again, these are, these are significant changes. Now, when you look at this, you think, okay, why would that be the case? Why would we be getting so much warmer, at least in State College, looking here at, at Central Pennsylvania? What may be causing this? Well, there's a couple of things. So urbanization is one reason. So when you start building more, and I can tell you State College, there's, there's a lot more buildings around and, and a lot more apartments and, and high-rise buildings. Um, if, you've, if you've been to State College recently, and compared to 10, 20 years ago, it looks, it looks very different. That can certainly have a warming effect, particularly uh, during the, the nighttime low temperature period where you don't get as cold at night. The location of the observation has moved, so we don't actually measure temperatures at the same location we did previously. That can have an impact, and these are, these are things you're always thinking about when you're looking at long-term climate data sets. What are the things that could impact these measurements? Well, what are we looking at here? Is this actually a trend, or are, are these possible issues with the data set? We're also getting more cloud cover at night, so our, our days and nights are, are, are tending to be cloudier um, over the past couple of decades compared to 100, 150 years ago. That can certainly have a warming effect at night. And then, of course, anthropogenic sources, if you're increasing greenhouse gases, increasing CO2 levels, that can also have a warming effect as well. Now, looking at, so this is a significant warming effect uh, with our nighttime temperatures, our, our lowest nighttime temperatures during the year. Now, looking at State College again, and we'll move on to other locations here in a minute, but if you compare that to the number of days during the year where we get above 90 degrees in State College, and you can see here, there's not a significant trend. You don't see, you would think that as we're warming, you know, our, our nighttime lows are getting and uh, you saw that increase in temperatures that we, we showed in the statewide charts, you would expect that our summertime temperatures would also be getting higher. So our number of hot days, which we're using here is approximately 90 degrees um, is the threshold for a relatively hot day. Um, we're not seeing that increase. So this may go against what you may consider, you know, conventional wisdom. Why, why would we not be seeing an increase in, in our number of hot days? So what could be the cause of that? Again, urbanization, while it can work it, it can work to warm temperatures overnight. It can also work to cool things during the day. Think about shadow effects that you have from buildings during the day where you might stay a little bit cooler near the ground than you would if it was wide open or just a bunch of, you know, like the, the middle of a parking lot with asphalt there. Um, it's gonna be a lot cooler if you have taller buildings around. You also have increased moisture content. So now some of the heat that, that some of your solar radiation that comes down during the day that's actually going into evaporating water in the atmosphere rather than directly warming the surface of the earth. So that increased moisture content can act to, to slow your warming during the day. And then foliage from nearby trees. So depending on what the vegetation looks like near the place where you're measuring temperatures, that can also have an impact on what the, what the number of hot days looks like on these kind of trend analyses. Now, if we, we shift over to Western Pennsylvania here for, for a minute, what does Pittsburgh look like? <laughs> and this is interesting. Look at the downward trend. So again, looking at the number of relatively hot days, okay? So this is January through December, but obviously most of these are gonna fall in that 
May through September period. So number of hot days during the summer months in Pittsburgh, this is the trend. So you can see if you just focus on the trend line here in Pittsburgh in the late 1800s, you were getting almost 20 days with re relatively hot days during the summer months. Now you're down to single digits five or six days a year um, where you get above 90 degrees in Pittsburgh. That's a significant trend, less than half of the number of days than what you saw in the late 1800s. So again, when you're looking at these different data sets, you'll, you'll notice that the trends that you may expect based on, hey, we're getting warmer, we're getting wetter. So you just translate that to, okay, our summers must be getting warmer. We must be getting a lot more hot days. Not necessarily the case. Now, if we take the flip of that, we go to Philadelphia. So now, now we're in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Look at this. Same metric, number of hot days, days above 90 degrees. So Pittsburgh, here's Philadelphia. Look at the increase. So you see starting off in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the late 1800s, you had between 12 and 14 days on average per year where you got above 90 degrees. Now you look at it, you've over doubled that. Now you're getting close to 30 days with uh, uh, afternoon high temperatures above 90 degrees. So your number of hot days in, in Philadelphia has almost doubled over the last 100 to 125 years. Again, these are significant trends in the data. And just looking at something like how many days per year do you get above 90, that, that's the kind of stuff that pops up. So it's far from a crystal clear picture when you start looking at this. So I, this is another example, this is Westchester. Now this is a different perspective. Here's the number of days where the low temperature drops below 10. So you would call this a relatively cold night during the winter months. When you drop below 10 degrees, you start to get, get into the single digits or below zero. How many days do you get that in Westchester? You'll notice here again, maybe counterintuitively, we're seeing an increase in the number of relatively chilly days based on this, this period. So we're going back to the late 1800s. You'll notice a gap in the data here, but look at the increase in temperatures um, or the, the, the increase in the number of days where you get temperatures below 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So starting off in the single digits, and now Westchester is seeing, uh, you know, between 12 and 15 days a year where you drop below 10. And you'll also notice, again, with all of these charts, it's all going to be a bit noisy, right? So we're looking at trends here. I'm focusing all of these charts. I focus mainly on the trends just because climate data is very noisy. You can have years with lots of really cold nights, and you can have years with barely any or sometimes zero where you drop below 10 degrees. So they're always going to be noisy data sets, but you do still see some trends that are interesting in the data. Now, looking at precipitation, so we focused on temperatures there for a minute. Now, what's what's happened in terms of precipitation? So now I'm focused on Harrisburg here. Um, while we're getting more precipitation, particularly during the fall months, we talked about that September through November period, the, the almost an additional month's worth of precipitation. Now, if you're looking at the number of days, so this is again calendar year, January through December, the number of days where the daily rainfall exceeds two inches. So we're considering these extreme rainfall events or, or heavy rainfall days where you're getting more more than two inches in a day that that's pretty high so you'll notice here that you started off with with less than one on average in, in harrisburg in the late 1800s and now you're getting close to two okay so an increase of about a day and a half um per year over the past 100 years or so that you're getting extreme rainfall events so very heavy rainfall days so that has an impact obviously you just Looking at something like this, we're just looking at the weather data here, but think about the amount of flooding events that occur because of this. When you have more than two inches in a day, you're likely to get somewhere where if there's a, a more flood prone area or somewhere where um, runoff is, is focused somewhere where, where, rain, where the, the, the rainwater is, is, is focused into an area where it's going to flood, these, these types of days you're getting several inches of rainfall, that can cause serious problems. So these are the things we're thinking about when we're looking at these trends. What are the potential societal impacts to this? And they're significant. Okay, so going into that a little bit, that's, that's a nice transition into the impacts of extreme events. So looking at rainfall, we just talked about the fact that, that flooding and flash flooding are serious problems. That affects transportation, critical infrastructure, obviously that, that can impact your home, it can impact your business. Um, if, you're, if your house um, uh, goes down the river, that, that's gonna be a serious problem, right? Um, if, if you have property damage, if your basement floods because um, you're, in, you're in the flood zone or a floodplain, um, that's gonna be serious problems, especially if you don't have flood insurance, which many people don't, particularly if they're not in a floodplain and they experience a significant flooding event, um, that's a serious, serious cost and, and a serious problem for the homeowner. It can, it can have health impacts. Certainly agriculture will be impacted by heavy rain events. So all of these things are, are serious issues. 
institutions um, that, that have uh, large societal impacts. Now, a lot of it's tied into land use and development. So when we're building new houses or we're building new developments or we're um, putting in commercial land or, or putting in businesses somewhere, there has to be a lot of thought put into, okay, you know, based on the amount of heavy rain we're seeing now, we need to be cognizant of what are we, what is our plans for runoff when we get really heavy rainfall? Um, do we have an area that's going to be able to um, be able to hold that much water if, if we do get a rain event without flooding your business or your home? These are all really important things to keep in mind. And again, like I mentioned before, flash flooding, when you're outside of designated flood zones, that leads to many more uninsured homes. And um, talking to emergency managers in the state, this has become a serious problem where many, many more homes are flooding, particularly basement flooding, and these, these homes are uninsured. So that, that comes out of your pocket when you're uninsured. So this is an interesting chart here. This is flood reports. The red dots are flood reports outside of the 100 year floodplain, outside of them. The green dots are inside of the 100 year floodplain. What this tells me when I look at this, the red dots, those homeowners were likely not insured. They probably didn't buy flood insurance because they weren't in a floodplain. The green dots, maybe they were, if they were thinking ahead or um, if it was required maybe for their insurance plan, but many of those homeowners that you're seeing there, those are likely people that were uninsured. So look at the amount of flooding events that happen outside of the 100 year floodplain. Okay, winter storm impacts. So we talked a lot about flooding. What about winter storms? So those obviously have significant impacts. We know that uh, dealing with many winter storms uh, each, each year in Pennsylvania, long-term utility outages. So if you have a significant event, sometimes you can have power outages in rural areas for several days or, or a couple of weeks even. Major transportation issues. Now we have commercial vehicle bans on interstates and major highways. So truckers um, can't be on major interstates when there's significant snowfall, which is good. It, it leads to less accidents, but that can have uh, supply, supply chain disruptions, um, which, which are not good either. Um, so that, that's, that's business costs, that's, that's economic costs right there. Uh, damages to homes and businesses too with winter storms, that's certainly true. High cost for snowfall removal, so you have to pay someone to get rid of that snowfall if you're a business or, or if you're a homeowner that, that hires someone to do that. Um, that, that can be a cost to you. School and business closures. So again, those are economic impacts. If you have to close, again, maybe some of us may be able to, to telework or, or work remotely. Um, and, and that certainly, there's been an increase in that over the past uh, several years and, and couple of decades, but, um, but there's still significant economic impact when you have to close um, because of snowfall or, or significant winter weather and damage to the environment. So these winter storms can have um, impacts to the environment as well. So this was a study focused on Northeastern Pennsylvania, but a lot of these things, um, the statistics might be slightly different, but certainly true of Southeastern Pennsylvania and much of the state really, um, looking at snowfall impacts over the past couple of decades. Since 1990, so if we look at the, the Scranton area here for a minute, three of the top five, three of the top five single day snow records were broken at the airport at Scranton Wilkes-Barre. So, um, so that's just in the past 30 years or so that we've broken the daily snowfall record um, for three of the top five events. And you can see what those events were. So the March 93 storm, which I'm sure some of you probably remember, uh, January 94 was another major snowstorm. And then we also had a, 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 um, a good snowstorm in March of 2017. Um, and th this study was done a couple of years ago, so we've even had some significant snowfall since then. I don't know if any have broken records specifically in Scranton, but we've had several significant snowfalls since this study was done. Um, the, there's also a, a snowfall impact scale, so, so they categorize snowstorms almost like hurricanes, but they're, they're based more off those category levels are based off of more uh, more on impact rather than like hurricanes are, are categorized based off of, of uh, wind speed. So in this case, you'll see that 12 of 12 category four to five storms that impacted the Northeast, um, impacted Northeastern Pennsylvania. And again, um, probably most of those, that's, that's true for Southeastern Pennsylvania as well. So significant storms um, have certainly been prominent over the past several decades um, across Pennsylvania, particularly Eastern PA. So 12 storms with more than 10 inches and six of those storms had over 20 inches of snow. So yeah, you're getting close to two feet at that point. So those are significant disruptions um, economically, um, lots of different impacts, societal impacts from, from those type of snow events. 
severe weather impact. So hail and wind da damage, we, we, we know uh, the potential problems there, property damage, agriculture, crop damage, utility outages, injuries and deaths, all those things are possible with hail and wind. Lightning damage, same, same sort of things, power and utility outages um, can, can, can start fires. Um, injury and death, certainly you can get struck by lightning. So th those are significant impacts there. And, and again, all of these things have significant local uh, economic disruption. So looking at tornado climatology here, so just focused on tornadoes, you can see up here, this is kind of a nice chart showing that on the EF scale, um, the distribution of tornadoes across Pennsylvania, this goes back to 1950. So you can see that we're fortunate in a way that a lot of our tornadic activity is relatively weak tornadoes. So EF0 to EF2, not that an EF1 or 2 is, is weak by any stretch, it can still cause significant damage, but certainly less disruptive than, than an EF3, 4, 5. So we thankfully those are relatively rare in the state of Pennsylvania, but they do happen. And then you can see down here, this is just the number of tornado reports by year since 1950 going through 2019. I actually included statistics for the last two years. We had six tornadoes. So we had a really quiet year actually in 2020. And then last year, extremely active. We had 44 tornadoes in the state of Pennsylvania. That's the second highest total since our most active year by far uh, back in 1998 with, uh, with 61 reports there in the state. So drought impact. So again, we don't see drought as often, um, but they, they, but it does occur. And again, we've we've seen some um, some minor drought impacts already this summer across parts of the state. So um, this is fresh and and, and some's mine depending on where you're at in the state. So that's water supply impacts, obviously food shortages. Uh, crop loss. So I, I was talking to um, one of our extension specialists across the state that works for Penn State, um, indicating that many farmers are not purchasing crop insurance because they haven't needed it because of the fact that we haven't had significant disruptions from drought. But this is a year where um, some of those some of those farmers are regretting not having crop insurance because of some of the losses that we're seeing um, with some of the crop, particularly in northeastern and even parts of southeastern Pennsylvania, where it's been relatively dry for the past couple of months. So that's a significant impact we're seeing statewide right now. Health and environmental hazards, economic losses, land use issues. So talking about the same sort of things with all of these all of these extreme weather events, but um, you, you can see all, all the, the potential societal impacts to all of this. So again, just talking briefly about drought, we, we haven't experienced, thankfully, widespread prolonged drought in the state since the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, that's partly due to the fact that we're seeing that increasing rainfall that we, we saw that that rainfall analysis earlier with not only more rain, particularly during the fall months, but across all seasons, but also extreme heavy rain events, the number of days where you're getting several inches of rain. So that certainly helps not um, lessen the impacts of drought or, or decreases the frequency of droughts in the state. But that raises the question that how will we react if drought conditions emerge when water usage that, that we've been adjusting to. So we're getting about an extra month's worth of rainfall in a calendar year than we did 100 years ago. So we sort of get used to that, right? So we're, we're used to having that, um, that healthy water supply and having plenty of, of water to work with. What happens when we don't have that? And that's sort of what we're seeing across parts of the state right now is we're not even dealing with significant drought impacts and certainly not prolonged drought impacts, but the summer has been relatively dry across parts of the state and we're seeing some challenges. And, and so this shows how vulnerable we are to drought when it does occur. So it's a, if, you, if you go out west or you, even people in the Midwest and deep south that have dealt with droughts um, much more recently than we have here in the Northeastern United States, they can tell you how important drought is. It's one of the things they talk about First thing when you talk about weather and climate is, is impacts of drought. So, um, so that's fresh in their minds, not as fresh in our minds here in the Northeast of Mid-Atlantic, but it has significant impacts. And, and like I said, we're, we're seeing a little bit of that this summer. So what does this all mean? So I went through a lot of data there and, and we'll talk again, we'll zoom out of Pennsylvania and talk a little bit about global climate change here in a minute. But all of this goes to show that all of these trends are interesting. It's showing the climate is changing. There's, there's different trends depending on where you're at, what location you're focused in, um, but the climate's always changing. So we have to try to boil, boil down the science to what are the major um, factors that impact uh, not only local climate, but global climate and how does that how does that impact when you zoom back into Pennsylvania? What are those global factors 
mean for for regions or, or states so that's where there's there's challenges with this with this type of science so um there there is a consensus that temperatures are generally going to rise and we're generally going to get wetter particularly here in the mid-atlantic region but how that is distributed across the globe that's far from certain there will be areas that become drier over the next couple of decades there will be areas that become cooler over the next couple of decades. So it becomes really problematic when you're looking at an individual region, a state, or, or even zooming down into the city or town level, it becomes really difficult to try to predict some of these things with any level of confidence. So that's where the challenge um, is. It, it all depends on what scale you're looking at. Globally, it's pretty easy to sum up what's, what's happened and where we may go from here. Zooming in this to individual locations becomes a lot more difficult. So that's where I want to talk about uh, global climate change, and then we'll talk about that that scientific communication and, and trying to communicate uncertainty is, is key to that. So if we look at climate change, we're going to look at the big picture here. So what are what are the major factors that influence our climate globally on a semi regular basis? Now again, we're talking about much longer timescales here for for climate forcings, but what you're looking at here is what is something called the Milankovitch cycle. So Anyone that talks about climate change, you know, it's all it's all about the sun, right? And of course, the sun is extremely important to climate. What this is showing you here are differences in how the Earth orbits the sun. So we have um, the eccentricity of our orbit actually changes. Think of it like a like a rubber band that stretches out and contracts, and that that represents our orbit around the sun. That changes. Now look at the time scales on this. This eccentricity. So we go from this more elongated ellipse to um, the the shorter ellipse. That happens on the scale of 100,000 to 400,000 years. That's not going to change climate in 50 or 100 years, um, like we've been observing over the past uh, century or so. These are much, much longer time scales. We wobble on our axis a little bit different. The tilt of our axis changes. So all of these things play a role, again, on really long time scales. This will change the climate significantly because of the impacts of how, how, how much the sun impacts our climate, but these are much longer time scales. So these can actually trigger and turn off ice ages. They are certainly capable of doing that, but those changes take thousands of years, okay? Next, uh, the next major player in the climate is the ocean system. So we think about the weather patterns and that's a way to transport heat to the poles and, and transport the cold down toward the, the equator or the tropical regions. That's one way to distribute heat across the, uh, across the globe. But the oceans actually play an even more important role. The, they're one of the key drivers of transporting heat from the, uh, from the equator in the tropics where the sun's energy is more focused and that's tran um, transporting that heat to the poles through these ocean currents. So so the one we're most familiar with here in North America is the, the Gulf Stream, right? That transports heat from the tropical regions um, just off of the coast of, of the Caribbean and off the southeast coast of the United States. That transports heat up the east coast, um, just off the east coast of the United States and Canada, and then up to um, parts of the North Atlantic into, into Europe. Um, that's, that's one of the main drivers of why Europe has a relatively moderate climate given how um, how far north in latitude they are. So that, that Gulf Stream plays a key role in the climate there. So these ocean currents are extremely important for how heat gets distributed and how it absorbs and re-emits heat. So there's an interaction between the atmosphere and the oceans where heat gets transferred from the air to the sea and then vice versa, from the sea to the air. Volcanic activity. Now this, um, volcanoes can play a role now, to impact climate globally, you're going to need a major volcanic eruption that will have a cooling effect. So obviously, when you have a major volcanic eruption, it's spewing lots of different particles into the atmosphere. Well, those particles generally have a cooling effect on the globe. But you can see here, this is just a, a chart of global average temperatures. You'll notice when we, when we mark these major volcanic eruptions over the past 150 years or so, that cooling effect does show up, but it's only for a couple of years. So a major volcanic eruption can cool your global temperatures, but on the order of maybe the next two to five years. It's going to be less than a decade's worth of impact uh, of cooling from a major volcanic eruption. So everything I just went through are well-known climate forcings. So these are, are well understood, they're well researched, and they're relatively accurately observed. That's, that's the key, is we're actually able to observe these things in a very accurate manner. However, these climate forcing mechanisms don't completely explain the current trend that we're seeing globally. So there's more to the story than just the things I went through. 
So I think I think this is a nice chart that kind of sums this up. So um, if if you break this down, looking at the red line, that is global uh, global air temperatures over the past 150 years or so. So looking back from the late 1800s through the most recent couple of years, you know, through about 2020 or so. So you'll notice that um, there's a pretty um, substantial increasing trend in temperatures during that period of time. The yellow line here is a measure of solar radiation, okay? So there are cycles in solar irradiance, how much solar radiation gets to the surface of the earth or measured at the top of the atmosphere, depending on where you're, you're measuring incoming solar radiation. But what this is showing you here is look how closely tied together these lines are from the 1800s through about the mid 1900s, that they tend to go up and down approximately at the same levels. But then once you hit the, the late 1940s and onward, they start to split. Okay, and it's it's really stark here over the past 40 to 50 years, how we just have seen temperatures go up and up and up and up and actually our solar uh, irradiance levels have actually decreased um, since the since about the late 1970s, early 1980s. So this split is showing you that there's more than just the sun and our, our climate forcings that we talked about before. All of those things are related to solar energy, right? So ocean currents, volcanic eruptions, all of that is impacting how solar radiation, that, that heat from solar radiation gets distributed across the globe. This is telling you that something else is causing a warming effect outside of the sun. That's what this chart tells you. So we have the greenhouse effect, right? So there's nothing controversial about this. This is just explaining how specific gases in the atmosphere act as a greenhouse. So they trap heat. Another way to think of it, rather than thinking of it like trapping heat like a blanket, the, these particles, the types of gases that are in the atmosphere, they're, they're able to be excited at the wavelengths that the sun emits radiation. So these particles will move and they'll, trans, uh, they'll transfer energy uh, across their own molecules and then affecting other atmospheric molecules. So they're, they're warming the atmosphere. They're able to absorb radiation and re-emit it, okay? So CO2 is a very efficient um, greenhouse gas because it is able to absorb. It's a very efficient absorber of solar radiation, and then it can re-emit it and, and keep some of that heat near the Earth's surface. That's why we focus on, on CO2, but there's many other greenhouse gases that are very efficient at this. That, and, and if we didn't have this, if the greenhouse effect didn't exist and our atmosphere was, was non-existent or these gases didn't exist, we would have a very cold planet. It would be extremely cold, almost uninhabitable based on the temperatures that we're comfortable as human beings. We, we become used to this greenhouse effect. So it's, very, it's a very good thing. We need the greenhouse effect. So this is showing carbon dioxide output from different industries. So this is focused on the mid-Atlantic, just showing you some of the primary sources of CO2, electric power being, being the largest, particularly in, in places like West Virginia and Pennsylvania, where there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of power plants and a lot, a lot of um, large coal industry, those sort of things that, that play a role there. Transportation, residential, industrial, those all um, produce CO2 at different levels. So this is just kind of showing you on a mid-Atlantic scale how some of that CO2 gets emitted and, and the, relative, the relative magnitudes of each industry. Now, something you may not think about is water vapor is actually a greenhouse gas as well. It's a very efficient um, absorber of solar radiation and then re-emittance of, of solar radiation. So again, that's all able to trap heat in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. That's what we call the greenhouse effect. So water vapor is very, very efficient at this. When there's more cloud cover, it can act to cool the atmosphere by reflecting light. So during the day, when you have sunlight coming in, it can reflect some of that sunlight back out to space because it's efficient at that. It, it, it can absorb and re-emit. So it can block some of the incoming solar radiation during the day, but it can also trap some of that heat at night. So the earth is radiating out radiation all the time as well. So at nighttime, some of that radiation is going out to space uh, going out into the atmosphere then it hits those clouds or that, that those uh, water vapor molecules that's able to absorb some of that radiation and then re-emit it back down to the earth's surface so again radiation budget is impacting temperatures and water vapor is, is one of the most efficient ways to do that so what does this all mean for global temperatures? So here's just a perspective again. This is showing you both uh, over the land and the ocean measuring temperatures across the globe. You can see that substantial increase in temperature. So there's no doubt when looking at any data set, essentially, you'll see this type of, uh, this type of increase in temperatures. So um, it, it becomes pretty substantial after about the late 1940s through the 1970s. And then you see that really sharp rise up in temperatures. 
um, this is just an illustration of how this works depending on what your view is. If you're looking at things globally, that's the top view. Now you'll see how noisy these data sets get as you zoom in on an individual location. So the global mean here is the green line. So you'll notice just how, the only reason I show this is just to show you how noisy data gets based on your spatial scale. So when you look at, when you average things globally, your, your mean temperatures don't change dramatically, right? So, so there's some ups and downs in the data, but not a lot. When you look at the United States, so you average temperatures over the US for that period of time, that blue line, you're getting a, you know, sharper ups and downs in the data set. And then you focus on a place like New York City. Notice how noisy the data gets uh, when you look at an ind individual city. So the, the data gets noisier as you zoom in on individual locations. So that, that's important, not only for looking at historical data, but then again, going back to that discussion of looking at model projections or, or future climate, um, that becomes an issue. Uncertainty increases when you zoom into individual locations. This is showing just a, a study of, of impacts of sea level rise on the Mid-Atlantic and Pennsylvania. Here in the Mid-Atlantic, we're, we're uh, very concerned about increases um, and impacts to eco ecosystems in, in the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay watershed. So there's lots of work going into what are the impacts of warming oceans, um, sea level rise on, on those, those regions and, and those particular bays. So this is just, just a study showing some, some of those projections in sea level rise. And some of the, some of the largest increases here um, are, are in these, these areas where you see the reds and even the golds are, are relatively um, large impacts from sea level rise. We mentioned in, inland flooding already. So again, as you get increases in extreme rainfall events, you're gonna get more flooding events in areas that weren't historically considered in a floodplain. So you think you're okay, you're not in a floodplain, you're not in a flood prone area, and then you get a heavy rainfall event and you find out, well, now, uh, based on what the weather is doing these days, I am in a floodplain or I am in, a, in an area that's that's susceptible to flash flooding. So that's that's uh, just re showing that that same map again of the impacts to the state of Pennsylvania. Impacts to agriculture. So this is um, obviously important for our, our large ag industry here across the state of Pennsylvania. By 2070, the number of hot nights could increase by 50 to 60 days, okay? So this is taken from the National Climate Assessment. This is our, our best climate model projections. So, so that indicates that, uh, so hot nights are what we're considering those in the top 2% of warmest nights between 1970 to 2000. So 98th percentile warmest nights across the state of Pennsylvania, we might be getting upwards of 50 to 60 more days in that top 2% by 2070. So just in you know, 30, 40 years from now. Um, 50 years from now, from, from, from 2020. At the current pace of warming, the growing season length across the state could be about a month longer in 40 to 50 years, okay? So your, um, the start of the growing season may bump up by as much as two to four weeks. And then at the end of the season, the growing season may, may end about two to four weeks later than what we're seeing right now. That can have significant impacts, both good and bad from an agricultural perspective. Because along with this, not only is your growing season longer, which again, that, that may be a good thing in some ways, the thing about ha having hotter nights and more moisture in the atmosphere, that leads to increases in disease susceptibility. So now your crops are more susceptible to sometimes invasive species that haven't been around, diseases that we haven't seen in the Mid-Atlantic region before. Now you might be having to deal with more um, diverse sets of diseases and, and fungi and things that are gonna grow on crops that cause serious problems. So while you might be able to grow crops for a longer period of time, you might be having to deal with significant impacts from, from disease risk from, um, from hotter and and uh, wetter weather during, during the overnight hours specifically. So this is another study showing the increase in rainfall. Um, you can see the Northeast is really where we've been under the target of these really heavy rainfall events. We've seen a 74% increase in the number of heavy rain events over the past uh, 50 years or so, okay? So that, that's substantial. So this is again, looking at, now they're, they're doing it instead of more than two inches in a day, this is more than two inches in a, in a 48 hour period. So relatively heavy rain events where you're getting persistent rainfall for, for a couple of days, we're seeing a 74% increase in the Northeast. And you can see an increase across much of the country, um, but the, the largest increase is here in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and parts of the Mid-Atlantic and, and even up in New England. So just to summarize all these impacts, the observed climate trends along with 
current climate projections indicate the following for the state of Pennsylvania. We're going to see an increase in temperatures. We've already observed that. We're going to get warmer nights along with relatively warmer days that we may not it becomes a, a, um, a murkier picture when you think about the number of hot days during the warmest uh, months of the year, during the summer season. We may not necessarily see an increase in those number of really hot days. But remember that heat is a leading cause of weather-related deaths in the state. So we're very, um, that's, a, that's a very sensitive climate impact that can lead to um, disease and, and death is, is having relatively hot days. And especially when you don't cool down at night, when you have nighttime temperatures that don't, don't drop below 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, that can lead to the, the ability not to cool off really for those that, that don't have air conditioning it causes serious problems. So, um, so that's a significant impact. Um, increasing moisture and precipitation, we're getting more annual rainfall. We talked about that already. More extreme rainfall events that lead to more flash and inland flooding events. Um, and stronger, but maybe less frequent winter storms. So we may not have um, the amount of cold air you would need for significant snowfall or uh, freezing or frozen precipitation. Um, but with those storms with that cold air in place, they may be more intense or, or, or have larger impacts. And again, we talked about the growing season length increase. That could potentially be an upside for ag, but again, you could have uh, significant impacts from disease growth because of uh, a healthier environment for those diseases. And then just to wrap it up here, um, scientific communication is a crucial aspect of any discipline, but especially in the sciences. And this is a, a problem, not just in the climate community, but weather forecasting as well. So we, we deal with weather, um, we, we deal with uncertainty and weather forecasts all the time, particularly when you get beyond 24, 48 hours out, or even during the summer months, even trying to figure out where a storm is going to pop up in a couple of hours can be really a challenge. So being able to communicate that uncertainty is key. So when we think about climate change, it's communicating that uncertainty, I think, is, is one of our biggest challenges. So you'll hear a lot sometimes reported in news stories, scientific consensus. What do we mean by consensus? Does that mean that there's a consensus that the earth is warming? that the earth is warming and we're playing some role in the trend, that human beings are playing some role in the trend. Um, the earth is warming and we're playing a larger role than any other influence. So, and, and what does consensus even mean? Are you talking about over half of scientists, over three quarters of scientists, 90% of the research? So we need to be careful about what types of terms we use and how does that get communicated to the public where they're going to understand what we mean by these things. Uh, looking at climate change projections, how good are the models? How do we accurately portray uncertainty and communicate this effectively to the public? So you'll see some of the caveats I gave for all the different data sets we used. When you zoom in on regions or states or individual locations, how that, that data gets noisy and the uncertainty levels increase, we need to be careful about that and communicate that to the public. What does global average temperature actually mean to someone living in southeastern Pennsylvania, like most of you? Um, what, what does that get, how does that impact you? What does a, a two degree in, increase in global average temperature mean for you? That, that's important. Obviously, you want answers to those kind of questions, and we have to try to communicate that. How does weather differ from climate? I, I see this um, confused all the time. It's, well, this winter was cold. I guess climate change doesn't exist, or it's been extremely hot this summer. It must be climate change. Neither one of those necessarily are completely accurate because weather is different than climate. Climate, you're looking at trends over years and decades and centuries. An individual season or an individual week of weather is not going to tell you really anything about climate. Climate will tell you maybe the, the frequency of whatever event you're, you're experiencing at the moment, whether that could increase or decrease, but it's not going to tell you that you're not going to get any any winter storms anymore because it's going to get warmer. You could still have that the weather is chaotic by nature. So you're going to have weird things happen all the time when it comes to weather. And, and science just generally needs to be clearly communicated along with uncertainties. Um, we've seen challenges with scientific communication, certainly during the pandemic. Um, there was a lot of criticism of of the CDC and, and public health experts, they had the same sort of problems that we deal with here in the atmospheric sciences and, and, and with climate change is trying to be precise, accurate, and reliable, and, and have the trust of the public. That is obviously a difficult thing, but we need to be better at it. And, and that's something that, that should be a focus for us over the next uh, years and decades so that we have the public trust. So 
the last thing I'll say here is climate change will not affect everyone equally at a local level. So again, some places may see cooling trends even for a period of time, or they might cool for a while and then warm up again. So it's not going to be a, a crystal clear picture that everybody gets warmer, everybody gets wetter all at once. That doesn't work that way. That's not how, how weather or climate works. Um, so it's important to differentiate local weather from global climate trends. So things like the number of wet days or hot days may not always increase in the given location, even if you've observed that. You know, like the, the trends we saw here, um, we've seen a, a significant increase in the number of, of wet days um, in a calendar year. That doesn't mean it'll always be that way. Or if you go um, a couple of counties over, that is going to be the same way there. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to think about, um, and there's a lot of confusion around that. So we need to be careful about how we communicate this. The oceans play a key role in heat distribution. Clouds affect the heat distributions. Um, things like snow, ice, forest, desert, they all play a role in climate. And there's many other factors. Some we understand better than others. Some we're able to quantify better than others. And we just need to be, be cognizant of that as well. So lots of things we understand well, still things we don't understand as well. And we just need to be honest about that. So there's just a, a, a closing picture just to show you how, um, how complex the interactions between the surface and the atmosphere work. Um, and with that, um, I will open it up to, to questions and I'll hand it back over to Amy and Zoe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. That was wonderful. Lots of great data. Thank you for pulling all of that together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, great. So um, we are open to questions. And again, um, if you move your cursor, your Zoom toolbar should reappear. And if you want to go to the Q&A section, click that and type in your question. We can ask some of those to Kyle. Someone was just asking a question if it's possible to get copies of the, the slides. Um, well, we have recorded it tonight, so we will definitely be sending that out. Um, as far as copies of the presentation, I don't think we're going to be able to do that, but you definitely will have um, a recording to be able to go back through and uh, review again. Yeah, and Amy, if anybody individually reaches out to you and they do want to copy the slides, I would be happy to, to share to share any of those graphs or charts with, any, with anybody that, that is interested. Okay. So I'd be happy to do that. Okay, great. So I guess, Kyle, one thing that I was just thinking about is, you know, mm -hmm. in the news recently about the Inflation Reduction Act, um, mm -hmm. you know, how that how that kind of infiltrates down to more of the state level and yeah. if you would at all play a role in that or be a consultant i mean do does the governor come to you for for data being the state climatologist yeah so that's um to answer your, the first part of your question, no, I'm not necessarily involved with policy decisions or how that funding gets distributed at the state level when it comes to the scientific advisor role or providing data for state agencies or even at the federal level, state climatologists are generally people that are well respected and, and we're, we're the people that, that they come to for climate data. So I do play a role in that sense that I do provide the data and provide any guidance from, from the science perspective and not necessarily the policy perspective. Great. All right, there's a question that came in. Do you attribute across United States differences in rainfall and temperature to shifts in wind patterns like El Nino, et cetera? Well, good question. So uh, the short answer is yes, that does play a role when it comes to wind patterns and El Nino and La Nina. Um, the question mark becomes, what, how does a, warm, a warmer and wetter climate impact when you're in El Nino or La Nina? Because they have different, so, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll explain that to anybody who doesn't know what El Nino or La Nina is. 
that is a measurement of the sea surface temperatures over the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So when those waters are warmer than they typically are, that's considered an El Nino. When they're cooler than average, that's a La Nina. Generally, in, uh, across much of the United States during El Nino events, when the waters are warmer, we tend to get it varies depending on where you're at in the region uh, or across the country. Um, you tend to get warmer and wetter weather um, across parts of the southern U.S. and even into the eastern U.S. La Niñas have a bit of an opposite effect, but even those relationships aren't necessarily clear cut. But climate change definitely has an impact on those large ocean atmosphere interactions. So I, I showed that um, graphic earlier of the ocean currents. So there are substantial interactions between the two, but I'd say that's one area where there is some uncertainty is how exactly do those large scale wind patterns and those ocean currents and major ocean circulation patterns, how do they change over the decades? That's a question mark, but that certainly does play a role in what, what your rainfall patterns look like, what your temperature patterns look like. So the, the short answer to that is yes. I was muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> a question came in about um, the Arctic ice, if you're able to speak about that at all or give an update. Yeah, so Arctic sea ice. That so the the thing we've seen with Arctic sea ice is that we've seen a substantial decrease in the level of Arctic sea ice. Now it's different between the Antarctic and the Arctic. We've actually seen, at least as of about ten years ago, Antarctic sea ice was actually increasing, but our Arctic sea ice was not. The re the well, there's there's two reasons why we care about that. When sea ice extent decreases. Um, that means that more of that water is melted and going into the oceans that can lead to sea level rise. But also, I think I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, the reflectivity of a surface can impact your climate. So when you have less ice cover or snow cover, that actually makes the earth less effective at reflecting incoming solar radiation. So what that means is that you're now absorbing more solar radiation. So the less snow or ice cover you have over the planet, the more heat gets trapped in the atmosphere and at the surface. So that's a warming impact as well. So it's sea level rise and warming. So we, we have observed decreases in Arctic sea ice, which is important, but again, it's, it's balanced at least a little bit by Antarctic sea ice, even though that's, that's even started to decrease over the past five or 10 years or so. Up your, you're muted, Amy, again. <laughs> I'm trying to be kind and mute in between, and it's just, <laughs> I'll just stop muting. Um, so one part of this question is um, thinking about the trends that you're showing, especially when you spoke about agriculture. Yeah. Um, you know, now thinking about us in the in the garden field and, yeah. and things that we might be putting in our landscapes. Um, does it make sense to start planting trees and shrubs and other plants that are native? to areas that are more Southern, since we're trending to be warmer in general? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I've heard this, um, I've, I've been in several talks by ag specialists that have mentioned this actually, that it may not be a bad idea to start planning for that, that in, in the next couple of decades that you can start to think about planning things that right now, you might be restricted to maybe Virginia or North Carolina and, and area south of there that may become something that's able to be grown here in Pennsylvania. So that's certainly a trend that we're seeing, particularly with growing season length. Like I said, our, our, our growing season length may rival what you now see in like Southern Virginia or North Carolina just in a couple of decades. So yeah, I, I think it's certainly something that you may not be able to act on it necessarily right now, but it's something to be thinking about of what, what are the opportunities you have. But again, the flip side of that is what are the types of diseases that may be native to those areas that we don't necessarily have here in Pennsylvania or the Mid-Atlantic? Um, what's going to creep into our region that you now have to think about as well? So it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, from a Jenkins perspective, I know that mm -hmm. our um, director of horticulture and curator, when he is going on plant exploration trips and collecting mm -hmm. trips, um, definitely is going south for yeah. plants and plant material um, and is really focusing his efforts on native azaleas and rhododendrons that are more Southern um, species uh, 
because of the the knowing warming trends. So right, that is something right. that we're looking at as well. And how, how far south? Just just out of curiosity, how far south is he, is he looking? That's a great question, and I don't know if I'm going to remember all the spots off the top of my head. I feel like yeah. it's I feel like it's like West Virginia, um, okay. Virginia, like yeah, more more down um, that direction. So okay, okay. The second part of this question was, you know, what kind of more in the climate solutions realm, and I'm not sure if you are uh, prepared to speak to climate solutions. I have. I have a solution to the question if you're not prepared to talk about climate <laughs> solutions. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's fair. Um, well, maybe ask the question. I'll tell you if I'll answer it. <laughs> it basically, you know, what can ordinary citizens do? You know, learning more about the changing climate and, um, you know, kind of what are some action items that we might be able to, to do to help? Yeah. No, it's, it's um, the, the way I answered this is there's, Unfortunately, at an individual level, it's something that you won't have a large impact on. There are things you can do, certainly, you know, things like recycling, energy efficiency, appliances in your homes, the same stuff that you hear all the time at, at media outlets. But when it comes to how you view climate change or, or what do you want to have happen, that obviously happens at the ballot box and, and you have to let your voice be known and, and you know, do what you feel is, is necessary to to push for for the policies that you think are, are right but um that's that's beyond my realm but that's certainly something that that's that's the best way to handle it is um supports politicians or or businesses that that match your views and 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 yeah we'll, we'll leave it at that mm -hmm. great thank you very much mm -hmm. and um one thing that i will just mention um you know the the book that we're reading for our um arboretum uh event we did have an author talk with um, with Kimberly Nicholas um, last month. And we do have a recording of that. So I will make sure that that is included in our resources section that I will send out to everyone when I send out the recording from tonight. Um, and she does give some solutions that she feels um, will make strides you know, from an individual level. So um, we'll share that with you and you guys can re review those, um, those as well. So. Great. Great. Let's see if anything else popped up here. Someone was just mentioning that it sounds like invasive species might continue to be on the increase as as climate change moves along. I think that's true. Yeah, I, I, that, that's a lot of the a lot of the research that's going on right now is with with those things. What are the kind of foreshadowing? What are the things that aren't here yet that could become a problem in the future, not only for the Mid-Atlantic, but even for the continental United States. There's there's a project that I worked peripherally on a couple of years ago with, with a uh, disease called wheat blast that I think is native right now to, to, I think it's Northern South America, maybe parts of Central America. I think Brazil is a problem, that, that's where it's most prominent. Um, but they're looking at, because of the fact that um, particularly the subtropical regions of the United States, like the Gulf Coast and Florida, that may be an area where wheat blast could spread into the United States. And then once it's there, you know, then, then it could potentially move on to, to northern latitudes. So, um, so that is definitely an area of ongoing research. I know the ag community is particularly sensitive to this, but they're, they're, they are worried about what the weather and climate trends are going to lead to in terms of susceptibility to that. So I, I, think, that, I think that is an area that, that we need to be concerned about, especially in the ag community, but for any grower. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Definitely, and as we're thinking and thinking about different plants that we might be moving and um, using in our own areas, just all the different things that come with with plants that have never really grown in in our our region as well. So, right. yeah. All right, last chance for questions. Anyone else out there have anything they want to share with with the group or ask Kyle? I think someone was looking for clarification. You were saying wheat, wheat blast, not weed blast. Wheat like yes, the yes, crop. wheat, wheat. Yeah, yes. wheat is in the crop. That's right. Wheat yes, blast. There we go. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being with us tonight, Kyle. This was wonderful. And we will have the recording ready for everyone 
um, early next week. And I will share that via Eventbrite. And uh, we will do our, our book giveaway. And so check your emails, look, keep a lookout um, to see if you might be a winner for um, a free copy of the Arboretum book that we're reading. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight and for sticking with us through the, the Q&A. Anything else you wanna share, Zoe? Yes, I just want to quickly remind people to uh, make sure you put your tickets in for our Beanstack. Um, we will be drawing uh, or picking a winner for our prize pack of reusable goodies. So be sure to um, get your tickets in on Beanstack. Great, and you're, you're choosing the winner tomorrow, correct, for Beanstack? That's correct, yes. Great, wonderful. All right, everybody, thank you again. And hopefully we'll see some of you at our um, next third Thursday lecture next month. Um, we will have our executive director from Jenkins is actually presenting on native grasses for your garden. So we're looking forward to that. All right, thank you again, Kyle, for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, good night, everybody. See you, everybody, good night. Bye. Bye.